welcome and happy Jewish New Year. Thank you for beginning the year 5782 with us. I'm Rachel Gordon and I teach in the Department of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies. Today's event is being sponsored by the Samuel Bud Shorstein Endowment in American Jewish Culture. And I'm delighted to see Bud Shorstein in our audience today. Um, the Shorstein Endowment is bringing us several events this semester, including two in October, one on October 5th with Professor Sarah Imhoff from Indiana University, who will be speaking about the crime of the century the Leopold and Loeb trial of 1924. And on October 12th, we'll have an event on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia with two expert scholars on that topic. Please register for those Zoom events if you're able to join us. I'm also, with the many people in our audience today, I'm very happy to see many of our undergraduates uh, from the Jews and Popular Culture class and from the Quest class on post-Holocaust American Jews. Um, for this afternoon's event, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Brian Chayette. Um, Professor Chayette is the Chair in Modern Literature and Culture at the University of Reading and a Fellow of the English Association. He has published 11 books, including four on anti-Semitism. He has been a visiting professor at Dartmouth College, the University of Michigan, and the University of Pennsylvania. He also holds fellowships at the University of Leeds, Southampton, and Birkbeck College, London. He is currently researching a book um, that I think is titled, or tentatively titled, Testimony Slave Camp Refugee, which will bring together slave narratives, camp testimonies, and refugee stories and dialogue. Uh, and he is also working on a book on anti-Semitism and empire, which will include an essay on Zangwill, Israel Zangwill. We're delighted to have Professor Shayette with us today. Um, after his talk, we will have time for your questions and comments. So whenever they occur to you, please feel free to write them in the chat or the Q&A, and we will try to get to as many as we can after Professor Shayette speaks. Uh, so I'm going to uh, let you take over from here, Professor Shayette. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And maybe you should warn me after 20 minutes. I'm, uh, with PowerPoint, you never know. Uh, uh, time flies, let's say. OK, thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. OK, has that worked? Great, OK. So um, the blue plaque that you can see uh, marks uh, the house uh, that Israel Zangwill lived in. Um, uh, he was British born. His family were from Eastern Europe, his mother and father, but he was British born. He lived in this house. He met uh, Theodore Herzl in this house. Um, and the, when Theodore Herzl came, he said, I am Theodore Herzl, help me to rebuild the Jewish state. And after that, um, Samuel became very much a, a follower of Herzl, a political Zionist. And uh, Herzl was the first Theodore to change his life. There is a second Theodore coming up in the lecture, the American uh, president Theodore Roosevelt. So a blue plaque marks uh, the house uh, that, uh, that uh, famous people, well-known people live in. You have to apply for a blue plaque, you have to make a case, and if you come to London especially, but I think now uh, over, all over Great Britain, you'll be able to see uh, blue plaques. Uh, where I live in North London, there's lots of them. Uh, all over the place, and it's always fun to check them out. Now, the reason I've started with the blue plaque is because um, today, I think, Zangwill, what we get are, are traces, rather like the blue plaque. Uh, I'm not sure how well known Zangwill is. Uh, I know that um, 
uh, certain key words of his concepts, such as the ghetto, which he popularized, his version of, of Zionism uh, or territorialism, uh, and the melting pot, which I'm going to focus on in my lecture today. These are all known, uh, but he's really a, a kind of trace figure. So you can go uh, on a Galit Zangwill tour in Tel Aviv. You can visit Rechov Zangwill in the Tanya. You can drink from the Zangwill bar on the Israeli coast, for instance. In the UK, there's tours of uh, the London's East End, equivalent to the Lower East Side in New York. Um, and uh, there are Zangwill tours, there's a Zangwill app. Um, there's a Zangwill house in the Jewish Free School where uh, Zangwill himself was educated, uh, which has been going now for, for uh, about a century. Uh, but uh, the 90th anniversary of his death in 2016 went completely unnoticed. So whilst there are these traces of Zangwill, um, and they all have a really rich story attached to them, and I'll try and show that in relation to the melting pot, a word that he very much popularized in the United States. Um, he, as a figure, um, we've really lost touch with him, even though he was, at the time, uh, one of the very best known uh, writers and thinkers in Britain and America. Now I'm going to start just with the context of the melting pot. I'll try and go through this quickly, which is why I wanted the 20 minute warning, uh, because um, after that we're going to look at the concept of the melting pot uh, in a bit more detail. But I want to show first of all the context of the melting pot. Uh, to, uh, America first among them, uh, also the global context where the ghetto fits in. Samuel was, was a ghetto writer and began as a ghetto writer and where his Zionism or territorialism also fits into all of this. And I think the Time magazine cover was used to um, publicize the talk. Uh, this is a year before Zangwill died in 1925. Uh, Zangwill was on the cover of, of Time uh, on more than one occasion. He was on the front covers of uh, all the major newspapers regularly whenever he toured. And he was very much a celebrity figure in uh, America, in Britain, and in uh, most of Western Europe. Now, Samuel's links with America, they began uh, in 1892. So when he was still in his 20s, uh, when he published uh, the best-selling uh, novel, Children of the Ghetto, a study of a peculiar people published by the Jewish Publication Society of America and commissioned uh, by the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, Judge Mayer Sulzberger, he was a prominent communal leader in, in Philadelphia, a founder and president of the JPSA, um, asked Samuel to write this novel, and it was the first novel to be published by the JPSA and, uh, and became a bestseller, as I've said. This began the connection that, uh, with, between Samuel and America, and six years later, he went on a tour. Uh, 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 for nearly a year, 1988 to 1999, sold out lecture tour from the northeast to the northwest. Uh, according to a, a writer at the time, Hamlin Garland, he said it, uh, his tour made the Spanish War a stale drama for the time. So there was a lot of excitement uh, with Zangwill uh, lecturing. Uh, in the end, he could fill the Carnegie Hall, 3,000 people. His lectures were broadcast live by radio. Again, he, it was an event when, uh, when Zangwill gave lectures. And it all began, as I say, uh, at this time with uh, enormous excitement. This is when Zangwill met Pres President Roosevelt, uh, the second Theodore that changed his life. Um, and we're going to see lots of connections between President Roosevelt and the play The Melting Pot, which uh, Zangwill dedicated to Roosevelt. Uh, 
Um, he met him 10 years before uh, the play uh, was first uh, um, debuted, when uh, President Roosevelt was governor-elect in New York. And later, Zhang Wu states that Jews never had a better friend than President Roosevelt. And as I say, he dedicated the melting pot to him. In 1899, this was the other reason, probably the main reason why Samuel uh, timed his tour for, for uh, Children of the Ghetto. So the novel was turned into a play, produced as a play in Washington, in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York. And this got Samuel into playwriting. And uh, some of his plays were extremely successful on Broadway. Children of the Ghetto was pretty successful, but it, I think it's most, the most important thing to notice it very much influenced American ghetto writers, Abraham Kahan, the great uh, writer of the uh, Lower East Side, the New York ghetto, as he called it. Um, so the lots of connections. He brought the word ghetto, we'll see, into the States, influenced Kahan, who wrote his own uh, ghetto fiction, as he called it, uh, also in the 1890s. Zangwill also made connections with uh, the poet Emma Lazarus. We'll, also, we'll see this as well uh, in the afterword uh, to The Melting Pot. So we have the play The Melting Pot. In 1914, Zangwill wrote an afterword where he uh, really answered his critics. And we'll, we'll look at uh, that in more detail in the second half of the lecture. But I'll just read you a, 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 a something about Emma Lazarus in particular, uh, the great poet, of course. Uh, and he said, it's no mere accident that when an inscription was needed for the colossal Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, that mother of exiles whose torch lights the entrance to the New Jerusalem, as he calls uh, America, the best ex expression of the spirit of Americanism was found in the sonnet of the Jewess, Emma Lazarus. So already uh, all kinds of themes uh, about uh, America as the New Jerusalem uh, are reinforced here uh, with regard to Emma Lazarus. Now what I, I, I want to, to do uh, briefly is counter the, the conventional view of Zangwill, uh, which is that uh, he was a walking contradiction. So people have asked, well, look, he writes about the ghetto, a form of Jewish particularism. He writes about the melting pot, which is a, a, a universal message, a form of universalism. And uh, he, he was also a Zionist uh, or a territorialist, eventually a Jewish territorialist another form of particularism. So they're saying, well, he must be a walking contradiction. And what I want to argue uh, uh, in this slide in particular, but throughout we'll see, is that he was very, very consistent. So as early as 1899, this is in a lecture that he gave in Philadelphia. It was published in his collected essays called Zionism, 1899. He, said, he, he basically gave his worldview we have to remember Britain was an imperial power and Samuel had a global view of the world. And the, and the world view says that there are three possibilities for the Jewish people. His main priority were, were five million East European Jews in Russia and Romania, who he regarded as that threat. And it was how to save these Jews that determined everything he did, including the melting pot, as we'll see. So three possibilities for Jews, he thought, in the future. One, national regeneration. So in other words, Zionism or territorialism. Two, religious regeneration. So Jewish spirituality. Outside, I think, of conventional religion, but a form of Jewish spirituality, which he associated, as we'll see, with the ghetto as did many other Zionists, uh, Max Nordau and, and uh, Pinsker and others, thought of the ghetto as a spiritual place, as a little Jerusalem, 
and disappearance assimilation. We'll see that uh, the melting pot is quite often uh, associated with a disappearance or assimilation. This is a much too, uh, uh, this is a very reduced reading and I'll argue against that reading. So national uh, or, uh, regeneration or what he called renationalized Judaism um, was not for Sangwul necessarily centered on Palestine. This is why he's, he's a controversial figure around many issues, not least the melting pot, uh, also around Palestine. He visited Palestine in 1897 where his father lived um, and he uh, saw uh, the number he gives uh, constantly is 600,000 uh, Palestinians living there. And he just wanted, didn't see how 5 million Jews that needed saving could fit into Palestine. And so he became a, a territorialist uh, around the Uganda option in 1905. Now, the second possibility for him is what he called denationalized Judaism, Jewish spirituality. And he, this is what he associated with what he called the American ideal. Uh, and it was expressed in the formula, Washington is our Zion. So we're back to America as the new Jerusalem. Washington is our Zion. And this ideal is expanded in the melting pot. And the idea of America as being a particular place that could save Jews, where Jews could live, wasn't just Sangwill's point of view. Quite a number of uh, Jewish thinkers, important Jewish thinkers, thought the same. Uh, first among them is Ahad Pam, a cultural Zionist. Now, the third possibility for the Jewish people was assimilation. And he said, but this, is, this was not easy. So he did look at the possibility of assimilation. Um, but because of the pogroms in Eastern Europe, and we'll see Kishinev in the melting pot, first among them, and anti-Semitism in general, uh, which motivated Jews to leave for America in the main, also Western Europe or Palestine. This meant that uh, Jews couldn't easily disappear. Couldn't easily disappear. And the point is, is that Zangwill, everything he did, and every single uh, way that he thought in relation to the ghetto, in relation to Zionism or territorialism, in relation to the melting pot, was to save 5 million East European Jews under threat. That was his main priority. So the ghetto, again, fits into this picture. Uh, he was very much associated with the ghetto. As we saw, it was the ghetto that brought uh, Zangwill to America. It was the ghetto that influenced quite a number of really important uh, ghetto writers in, in America, Kahan and Antin first among them. He wrote uh, four books with the, t with the title of the ghetto. He popularized the word ghetto in the English language, just as he popularized the melting pot in the English language. And what he did, and we'll see, this is quite um, common for Zangwill. He took the German tradition, he took a European tradition, which was very much extant. Uh, uh, Germans were writing about the ghetto from the, nine, nine, from the nine, uh, 1820s until the 1870s or 80s. But they imagined the ghetto very much in rural Eastern Europe. Sangwell was the first to reimagine the ghetto as an ethnic enclave in the modern metropolis in London, New York, Chicago. And as I've said, this influence, this change influenced many writers, uh, beginning with Kahan. On arriving in New York in 1882, Kahan was met by Emma Lazarus on Ward Island. She met uh, many, many refugees coming in. Kahan was just one among many. Uh, at the time, coincidentally, Lazarus was carrying a copy of German ghetto stories in translation, which she reviewed. So this was very much, again, the ghetto was a contentious issue. German Jews that had lived in New York uh, for many decades disliked the term uh, intensely. Uh, Theodore Herzl very much was part of that tradition. He wrote a play called The New Ghetto and the phrase ghetto mentality, which is a bit of a slur came out of that tradition. 
But Zangwill came from another tradition where, which regarded the ghetto as a place of Jewish spirituality. And this goes all the way back to the first ghettos in Italy, the Italian ghettos, um, as a form of Jewish territorialism. And he argued, uh, Max Nordo, in the, his first speech that he gave to the Zionist con Congress, Nordo following Zangwill, and um, they were close friends, he said that the ghetto contained specifically Jewish qualities and were a spur to the human spirit. And as Zangwill thought, the ghetto was a smaller spiritual version of the Jewish nation. And we'll see that the melting pot, I would argue, is the ghetto, if you like, uh, or a version of Jewish spirituality uh, on a much larger stage. So, Jewish territorialism. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob, <laughs> that's the name of my son, who I have to say has been a great technical help. So, uh, um, shout out for my son. Um, so, this is a picture of Zangwill, who was the president of the Jewish Territorialist Organization. He's right at the front, I think you can see. Uh, Herzl, who was a territorialist. So Herzl looked to Argentina, Herzl looked to Egypt for Jewish uh, nation, where, where Jews could live, um, and uh, was in favor of the Uganda option before he died. Uh, the Jewish territorialist organization essentially left the mainstream Zionist organization to explore the Uganda option via the British colonial office. And as I say, uh, he did this because he thought it was the most practical way of coming to rescue the 5 million East European Jews under threat. So he thought finding a, a place where the, uh, a halfway house, it was called, where Jews could live uh, uh, while Palestine was being established, um, um, he very much thought that this was the quickest, most practical way of saving Jews. And this, of course, became incredibly contentious. Um, uh, the territorialists said that uh, we are more interested in people than land. Uh, the Zionists were more interested in land than people. The Jewish territorialists looked to all Jews, uh, Zionists looked to those Jews who wanted to immigrate to Palestine. So this caused enormous friction. Uh, um, and this is one reason I think why, why Zangwill is forgotten. It's again, incredibly controversial as an issue. And of course, uh, it didn't work. Zangwill looked to Canada, to Australia, Angola, Libya, Portugal, uh, as well as Palestine. And in the end, uh, he couldn't find uh, an ethnic enclave. He couldn't find a place where the East European Jews could quickly move. There were all kinds of obstacles put in his place. But Zangwill sacrificed his life for this cause over 15 years. Uh, his last book of fiction, Ghetto Comedies in 1907, uh, meant that he ceased to become a writer. Uh, that's why he became a playwright. Uh, writing The Melting Pot the next year in 1908. And the contrast here is very much with Abraham Kahan, who never stopped writing fiction. And this cul culminated in his masterpiece, The Rise of David Levinsky, published in 1917. And this was at the time as, that Zangwill was addressing the consequences of the Balfour Declaration for Jewish territorialism, where he went back into the Zionist movement, the mainstream Zionist movement. In other words, Zangwill sacrificed novel writing in a bid to save the Jewish people. Okay, so this is the last slide of this first half. Um, can you see the slides on the side, Rachel? Or, or... Um, yes, I didn't want to interrupt you and it took ah, me okay. to realize. Okay. I heard <laughs> my son, as soon as I mentioned my son, I thought, uh, yeah, um, let's see if I can get rid of them. Uh, that's a mistake, okay, right. Anyway, I've got rid of them. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rachel. All right. So just to sum up this first half about, about the context for the melting pot um, and, and, and Zangwill having uh, not being a walking contradiction, but actually everything he did was, was very much uh, for one reason, 
So when Zhang Wo traveled to Washington, D.C., he traveled from Libya, which at the time he was assessing as a potential Jewish enclave. He traveled by boat. He wasn't sure if he would arrive on time for the premiere of the melting pot, uh, but decided anyway to invite President Roosevelt, the First Lady, and uh, Roosevelt's cabinet. And about half the cabinet attended, but Roosevelt and the First Lady were there in the opening night. Now, Zangwill's priority while he was in Washington was to give active and practical support to the Galveston immigration project. He'd been working on that for years as a territorialist. Again, and anything he could do practically uh, to help Eastern European Jews leave, he did. And between 1908 and 1914, the Galveston Project uh, diverted nearly 74,000 Jews from America's crowded eastern cities to, to west of the Mississippi via the port of Galveston. At the time, Galveston was known as the Ellis Island of the West. I, I'm pretty sure it's still not known as that today, but that's what it was known as at the time. Um, and Zangwill uh, again thought of the, uh, the Jewish spirit in relation to America and um, Amer uh, as a form of universalized Judaism, going back to the founding fathers of America, as we'll see in the, pl uh, the play, the, the melting pot. Um, and this was an ethical ideal um, which he firmly believed in and firmly supported any project that, that could uh, help Jews from Eastern Europe travel. Steve Zipperstein, in his most recent book on, uh, called Pogrom, which is all about the myth of Kishinev, which of course is, is very prominent in the melting pot, the whole of the plot go, uh, coincides with Kishinev. And Zipperstein characterizes the power of Zangwill's own mythologizing as follows. He's, he says that America represented the spot where all races and nations come to look forward. And we're going to see all, all kinds of arguments and images of looking forward in the melting pot. In contrast to the horrors of Kishinev, which was the site of again, and this is quoting from the play once more, where obscenity is beyond human utterance. And Kishinev, um, this is Samuel shows, uh, was very much a, uh, became a kind of a myth, a way of talking about pogroms in general. Um, it became uh, using a, a critical term, a metonym. So in other words, a small part represented the whole. So Kishinev represented the whole of uh, persecution against Jews. Um, just as today we might use the word Auschwitz to represent the Holocaust as a whole. Um, and when the word was used in the theatre, uh, critics said it was uh, electric, quite literally, that, that uh, uh, people responded um, um, almost as if we would respond today using the word Auschwitz. I think that's the nearest equivalent that I can think of, even though, of course, completely different histories and contexts. Now, this is something we could discuss in question and answer session. The premiere of the melting pot, which Samuel did make, and uh, um, was held on the October the 5th, 1908. October the 5th, 1908 was Yom Kippur. So uh, does this highlight uh, Jew that Jewish spirituality is universalized by Zangwill? As I've said, he certainly promoted the idea of Jewish spirituality, but outside of a particular religious framework. And having the melting pot uh, um, shown for the first time on Yom Kippur clearly highlights that. Okay, so we're going from context. I don't know if I'm well over the 20 minutes, Rachel, you'll have to tell me. We're doing well, time. Are, are we okay? I, uh, uh, okay, my son always tells me too many words on your slides, too long, too long. <laughs> I hear his voice in my head, but that's uh, okay. I'm glad we're doing well. 
So we're going from context to concept now. So the concept of the melting pot. And uh, I'm going to focus in particular on American pluralism, how the melting pot fits in with American pluralism. And we're going to look at a range of writers in relation to the melting pot. So Mary Antin, who I've mentioned, her, her wonderful memoir called The Promised Land. Ralph Ellison, Horace Kalin, who totally opposed the melting pot, and we'll, we'll look at that. Emma Lazarus once more, and Werner Sollers, who uh, has done more than anyone to complicate and promote and to make us think about the, the melting pot in, all, in really complex ways. So this is my list uh, um, that I could fit onto that slide. There, there are a few more writers. And here they are. So uh, you can see the books. There's Nathan Glazer, Glazer who totally opposed the melting pot idea. I'm calling this melting pot polemics. And what I want to do is move away from the polemics, but I'll introduce them first of all, and then we'll, we'll show a, a more complicated melting pot in relation to the play. But Nathan Glazer, uh, in this book, he says, the point about the melting pot, so beyond the melting pot, he says, the point about the melting pot is that it did not happen. So that's a famous quote by Nathan Glazer. Of course, the, the, that begs the question, what does he mean by the melting pot? If he means complete integration, complete assimilation, oh yes, that didn't happen. But uh, Zhang Will did not define the melting pot in those terms. So uh, it begs the question, as we say. This is the book uh, by Bernard, uh, by Werner Sollers, Beyond Ethnicity, which really looks at the melting pot in relation to what he calls consent and dissent in American culture. And I'll reinforce that reading in my talk. It's still a very important reading. And Solos here says, more than any other social or political theory, the re rhetoric of Samuel's play shaped Americans' discourse on immigration and ethnicity. So this is how important a historian uh, a, 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 and a social theorist of ethnicity regards Samuel's play. It shaped American discourse on immigration and ethnicity. It was, of course, very much a pro-immigration play just as The Children of the Ghetto uh, was a pro-immigration novel um, at a time in Britain uh, uh, when immigration laws were enacted in 1905. So that's very much, again, a context for Zangwill to prevent similar laws being enacted in the United States. But what Soller says is that uh, the language of self-declared opponents of the melting pot concept also uses a, 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 and talks about the melting pot really incorrectly. And so Solas uh, very much uh, is against Glazer's point of view, also Kalen's point of view as well, as we'll see. There's a very good essay in Insider Outsider, American Jews and Multiculturalism by, by David Bialy. Um, and he argues that Zangwill popularized the term melting pot in American political discourse, thus setting in motion a debate that has raged for most of the 20th century. I mean, this is quite an astonishing claim to be made from Horace Kalin's cultural pluralism in 1915, which we're going to look at, to Nathan Glazer's Beyond the Melting Pot, which I've mentioned culminating in the struggles about multiculturalism in the 1980s and 90s. And that's the context for Ralph Ellison, which we're also going to look at. Uh, Samuel's melting pot has continued to reverberate in a variety of incarnations. So tremendously important uh, for almost a century, according to the great uh, Jewish historian, David Bialy. Um, Tamar Jacobi, who's moved away from the, uh, a reductive critique of the melting pot in her book, Reinventing the Melting Pot. This is, uh, I think, the last book published uh, on this slide, Samuel did not claim that immigrants had to become English or ape the ways of Anglo-Americans. So this is the claim that's often made against Samuel. Thinkers who supported the melting pot concept believed that immigrants would be changed by America, to be sure. But they also expected that America would be changed by the immigrants. And that's the key point here, that most people that criticise Samuel's melting pot uh, use the first part of that argument. They say, 
well, uh, it's all about America changing immigrants. But the second part of this argument is just as important that uh, America will be changed by the immigrants. It's not just about immigrants being changed by America. So it's the two parts of that point, which I think are important. So polemics. So of course, just go online, you can find any kind of polemics you want. Uh, you can find, as Monty Python used to say, five minute polemics, an hour polemics, two hours polemics, a lifetime of polemics. Here's just five minutes of polemics. So a quote from Zhang Will, America is God's crucible, the great melting pot where all the races of Europe are melting and reforming. We'll see that um, this is just one aspect of Zhang Will's melting pot, but it's, uh, it's seen as very Eurocentric. Um, and um, uh, we'll see that Zhang Will, uh, this isn't entirely true. Uh, and we can see this especially in, in the afterword. So how do we oppose the melting pot? We oppose it with the salad bowl. Jane Elliott, a, 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 an activist, argues in a salad bowl, you put all the different things. You want the vegetables, the lettuce, the cucumbers, the onions. We don't need a melting pot to maintain their identity. So this is a form of identity politics. You appreciate differences, but this assumes that Zhang Will wants to do away a, again with all differences, uh, that he wants everyone to, to turn out the same, um, and that uh, it's a form of enforced assimilationism. That's the assumption. It's absolutely not true. Okay, but this assumption does have grounds, of course, in history. Um, and I think when people criticize Zhang Will, they're really criticizing um, uh, this form of Americanizing the melting pot. What Zhang Will's doing, to be honest, if anything, is ethnicizing the melting pot. And we'll see that uh, later on, rather than Americanizing the me melting pot. But many did Americanize the melting pot. The most famous was uh, Ford, Henry Ford. Uh, who's also famous for being uh, a believer in the Jewish world conspiracy. But here uh, he simply believes in a form of enforced assimilationism. And he enacts the melting pot uh, famously in uh, the Ford Motor Company, in Motor Company English School, which required immigrants to dramatize the abandonment of distinct ethnic origins for an undifferentiated Americanness. And so what these workers did uh, they started wearing various national costumes, uh, presumably coming straight from uh, Ellis Island uh, or Galveston. Uh, and they were processed from this imagined steamship to a staged melting pot. We can see the melting pot here. So they go in in their uh, particular ethnic uh, dress into this melting pot and they come out identically in American clothes, waving American flags, as we can see at the front here. And this was a staged performance, a dramatic performance, which uh, was famous at the time, uh, during the First World War, um, and was very much in people's minds when they are thinking of a, a unitary, uh, very narrow, Americanized version of the melting pot. Um, as a form of integration without any kind of difference. Now, I would argue that Horace Kalin, who was writing at the same time as the Ford Motor Company, as the school, from a progressive, a more progressive point of view, uh, believed also in uh, this Americanized view of the melting pot and thought that Zangwill uh, was promoting it in the way that Henry Ford did, which is in, completely not true. So Horace Kalin argues in Democracy versus the Melting Pot, where he deals directly with Zhang Will's play, as well as with Ford. He says the Melting Pot means the complete cutting off of the ancestral memories of the American populations, the enforced exclusive use of the English language in schools and in daily life. So for him, uh, um, for Kalin, um, 
ethnic difference and maintaining ethnic difference was uh, he associated to, with democracy. And the negation of this difference, the enforced negation of this difference, he regarded as undemocratic. Again, that's assuming this version of the melting pot, uh, um, which uh, certainly Henry Ford, an extremist, uh, believed in, but Samuel didn't. Roosevelt came close to Ford, and we'll see this. And this is why the association between Samuel and, and Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, is, is complicated. But um, we can see with Calum, this belief in ethnicity, ethnic difference, identity politics, an early version of identity politics, also is, can be suspect. He argued in the same essay, he says, men may change their clothes, their politics, their wives, their religions, their philosophies, to a greater or lesser extent. They cannot change their grandfathers. So here, the question of descent, the question of uh, an ancestral view of identity, which is unchanging and, and purely based on descent, uh, is actually a really narrow view of identity and of ethnicity. And the last thing I want to say about Kaylin, it's an irony that both Zangwill and Kaylin actually use exactly the same image for a multicultural uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, and of course the melting pot and uh, Zangwill's uh, uh, melting pot is nothing if not a a, a play about American exceptionalism. And they both use the idea of the orchestra, uh, the harmonies of an orchestra. Uh, they use that metaphor both to back up their point, one on the side of cultural pluralism, one on the side of the melting pot. I should say that my description of um, the Ford uh, factory is taken from a, uh, a book in the bibliography at the end by Sarah Wilson called Melting Pot Modernism. Okay, and this is another example of how the melting pot can be used in all kinds of different and contradictory ways. Here it's used uh, very much in anti-immigration terms uh, and really um, in uh, really a horrible, nasty way so uh, we cannot digest the scum. And there's lots of images of the melting pot uh, um, throughout uh, the century where certain groups can't be digested. So here, examples of uh, Bolshevism, which of course can bring in question, uh, um, East, Jewish East Europeans, uh, um, mad notions of Europe, so different versions of Europe. And, and it's very racialized here. So um, uh, Ross here talks about American blood and immigrant blood as if they're completely different. Uh, and he compares what he calls the blondes, uh, which the Nazis called the Aryans, and the brunettes, so, so uh, darker nationalities. It's the blondes from uh, Northern Europe that he's on the side of. These were the truth tellers. You can believe them. They're true. Uh, it's, um, uh, he says that immigrant officials argue that the brunettes, the darker nations, so in other words, from Eastern Europe or from Northern Europe, uh, these simply you can't believe a word they say. And this kind of race thinking actually influenced uh, the 1924 Anti-Immigration Act in America. And I guess one of the horrible ironies of this kind of race thinking is that it was a, a very European way of thinking about the world. Okay, so we can see the melting pot in relation to all kinds of polarities, all kinds of appropriations, but uh, the roots of the melting pot, as I showed, uh, comes from the 10-year friendship and the 10-year correspondence between Sangwell and Roosevelt. And no one's really uh, mapped that correspondence. I, I, I'm going to spend some time in Washington, actually at the, mu the Holocaust Museum. But while I'm there, I'll, I'll just see what kind of correspondence there is, because I, it's probably too vast 
for people to have met. But they had a, 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 a lifelong friendship, a lifelong correspondence. And I'll, I'll quote, first of all, um, well, I quote in the title, that's a great play, Mr. Zangwill. And this is uh, President Roosevelt uh, shouted that out at the end of the, the play. And that was used on the publicity material for the play and was one reason why the play was extremely successful uh, and did uh, um, uh, was shown for many, many months. That's a great play, Mr. Zangwill. But Roosevelt's version of the melting pot was not Zangwill's. So Roosevelt uh, articulates this uh, in 1917. He says, we Americans are the children of the crucible. And the melting pot actually was going to be called the crucible initially. But um, Zangwill, we're not quite sure where Zangwill, why he used the melting pot. Again, it was a word he popularized, he didn't invent. Um, there is a, 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 an English writer from German background called Ford Maddox Ford, who a year before uh, um, had a chapter in the book called The Spirit of the English, where he talked about um, England as a melting pot nation, and, and uh, that was the title of the chapter. My guess is that that's where Zangwill used the word and why he used the word. Uh, but he changed it quite late. The play was called The Crucible, really up until a few months uh, before uh, it, it was uh, made. So here we have Roosevelt. The crucible does not do its work unless it turns out those cast into it in one national mold. So this unitary singular version of the melting pot. And that must be the mold established by Washington and his fellows. So we have a mold and the immigrants are changed by it, but America stays the same. Uh, very much a kind of uh, Anglo-centric version of America and American history when they made us into a nation. So this is uh, Theodore Roosevelt's, President Roosevelt's version of the melting pot. President Roosevelt had an infamous campaign against what he called the ethnic hyphen, which was a complete failure. So he was against the hyphen, uh, Jewish American, African American, Italian American, etc. Um, despite his assistance that only 100% uh, American, uh, Americanism, as he put it, would do, the hyphen eventually, of course, became a symbol of America. And in the words of uh, Tamar Jacobi, an emblem of the uh, immigrant bargain that is among the most distinctive features of American culture. Having said that, the, there was only one uh, uh, line that Roosevelt objected to in the play, and that wasn't about uh, the notion of the melting pot. It was to do with Quincy and the association of uh, Quin Quincy's womanizing with um, uh, uh, the um, number of divorces in the United States. That was the only line that he objected to and Zangwill did change it. But notions of the melting pot weren't changed. And we'll see, this is kind of unusual. Uh, perhaps it was just political um, because if you read the play and you look at it in detail, uh, Zangwill argues the real American has not yet arrived. So here, the melting pot is a process. It's a process. The real American has not yet arrived. He's only in the crucible, I tell you. He'll be the fusion of all races, the coming Superman. So a bit Nietzschean, but the important thing here is that the melting pot was a process. It wasn't simply about a national mold and, beco and, uh, and becoming uh, um, uh, a kind of Washingtonian American. Absolutely not. And again, he, uh, in the afterwards, he reinforces this. The process of American amalgamation is not assimilation. So Samuel is quite explicit about this. As we've seen, everyone assumes he's on the side of assimilation or, integ or integration. He says it's not about assimilation or a surrender to a dominant type, as is popularly supposed to this day but what he calls an all-round give and take by which the final type may be enriched or impoverished. So again, a process, 
give and take. We don't yet know what the endpoint will be. All we know is that it's a process. Um, Aviva Ta uh, Taubenfeld's book on, Roosevelt, uh, on President Roosevelt and the culture surrounding him makes it quite plain that Roosevelt's notion of the crucible differed dramatically from Zhang Wills. And she shows this in great detail in her book, which is in the bibliography we'll see at the end. Okay, so now we're complicating notions of the melting pot in relation to the play. And here, uh, Werner Sollers helps us, I think, a great deal. So Sollers argues that images of melting, he associates with consent. So love, nature, art. These are all forms of performing ethnicity, of moving beyond one's uh, descendants, one's antecedents, one's grandfathers, as Galen would have it, uh, and making connections across uh, ethnicity. And this he compares with images of hardness, descent, lack of love, artlessness, a bloody past, Kishinev, of course. So this is the tension that he sees in the play. And the point about the play, as, as any uh, uh, works of literature, works of the imagination, is that it looks at all sides, all sides. So we look at the question of descent here. So this it reaches its peak when uh, David hears of Vera's father's involvement in Kishinev, and he says, there is a river of blood between us now. So if the play would have finished at that point, descent would have been the main narrative of the play, that uh, the love between David and Vera was impossible because Vera's father was involved with Kishinev. Ethnic descent as well, David to, to Quincy. So Quincy is uh, quite a number of the uh, figures in the play begin as anti Semite. So Vera begins as an anti-Semite, Kathleen as well. Uh, Quincy begins and ends as an anti-Semite. So uh, David talks about the melting pot, talks about America, and Quincy just challenges him because Quincy is a, a native-born American. Uh, and he says, but you're a Jew immigrant. Uh, and David says, yes, a Jew, Im Jew immigrant, but a Jew who knows that your pilgrim fathers come straight out of the Old Testament and that our Jew immigrants are a great, greater factor in the glory of this commonwealth than some of you sons of the soil. So Quincy is the only white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the play, but he's actually probably the most degenerate character in the play through his womanizing, his adultery, uh, um, his corruption. Um, and so David can take the high ground in relation to Quincy as I say, in relation to Quincy's divorce, that was too much for President Roosevelt. This is also here we have uh, a sense of ethnicizing the melting pot, which certainly I think the play does to some extent, but not completely, as we'll see. So consent now. Um, so David, um, uh, this is uh, now towards the end of the play when the river of blood between the two of them. Uh, is dissipated. And he says, Ah, Vera, what is the glory of Roman Jerusalem, where all nations and races come to worship and look back, compared with the glory of America, where all nations and, and races come to labor and look forward, look forward. So America is a place, and the melting pot is a place where you look forward. Europe and European history, and uh, the great histories also of uh, um, Jerusalem and uh, Judaism is a place where you look back, you look back. And so uh, David has to transcend uh, um, what he knows about Vera's family's involvement with Kishinev and transcends through, uh, through love. And this becomes a redemptive narrative in the play. There's also cosmopolitanism in the play as well. And so as well as uh, Zhang Wu's ethnic melting pot, there's also a cosmopolitan melting pot as well. So Quincy, 
uh, talks to Vera, he says, you don't mean to say you've brought me a Jew. So again, as I say, he remains an anti-Semite throughout the play. And Vera says, I'm afraid I have. I was thinking only of his genius, not his race. So many music mu <laughs> musicians are Jews. And this uh, uh, is very much uh, against uh, anti-Semitic theories that argue that, you, uh, from Wagner onwards, that argue that Jews uh, could not uh, be music musicians. And Zanwill's countering this uh, uh, in general and also in relation to Quincy. More cosmopolitanism at the end. So David says, there she lies, the great melting pot. Listen, can't you hear the roaring and bubbling? There gapes her mouth. So again, the womanizing of America, as we, we saw in relation to Emma, Emma, or the feminizing in relation, as we've seen in relation to Emma Lazarus, is something that's in the play. There gapes her mouth, the harbour with its human freight. Ah, what a stirring and a seething. Celt and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian. And this is a key phrase, uh, black and yellow. And these were very much uh, races that were denigrated at the time, um, but which Zangwill does include in the melting pot. And we'll look more at that in relation to African-Americans. Vera softly nestling to him also says Jew and Gentile. So again, bringing together the conflicts of Europe uh, and transcending them in the melting pot of the United States. So a utopian view of America and very much as um, a for America as a form of exceptionalism. Now, this I think complicates things even more. This is the Irish uh, figure of Kathleen. And I'll, uh, there's a book uh, that I'll refer to at the end in the bibliography that looks at the Irish Jewish uh, nexus in, in American literature, including the melting pot. Now Kathleen begins conventionally as a kind of Irish Catholic anti-Semite in Act One, but changes throughout the play. And we'll see this. So by the end of Act One, uh, she says, oh, Miss, oh, Mr. David, I won't mix crockery, I won't. And this is because um, she's already being influenced here by uh, Frau Quixana, uh, David's mother. So Kathleen, that's what the mistress is so miserable about. So Frau Quixano, you don't keep the carnival, Purim. There's noses for both of you in the kitchen to see your noses laying around so solemn and neglected faith. It nearly makes me cry myself. So here, uh, um, the lack of, uh, um, and the difference in generations and the lack of religious uh, um, uh, devotion, the lack of Judaism in its formal mode is also part of the play as well. And Kathleen uh, identifies uh, more and more with Frau Quixano, even though she's very much a stage Irish woman. And the other thing we can say about the play is that, that it is a melodrama. It is staging different eth ethnicities uh, melodramatically. So Kathleen here says, call yourself a Jew and you forgetting Purim. And now David to Kathleen explaining uh, um, the loneliness of Frau Quixano. He says, one day my uncle Mendel sent Frau Quixano a ticket to come to America, but it's not so happy for her here because my uncle has to be near a theater and can't live in the Jewish quarter. And so nobody understands her. And she sits all day alone with her book and her religion and her memories. And at this point, Kathleen completely breaks down. Oh, Mr. David. So here we have uh, connections between different ethnicities. Here, a form of performing ethnicity or what Werner Sollers calls consent. Quincy, on the other hand, doesn't change at all. Why do you want a nose like that? So this is because uh, Purim is a carnival. Kathleen says, because we're Hebrews. So here she's identifying as a Hebrew, and by the end, in Irish sounding Yiddish, she says, Begora, we Jews never know our way. So she becomes more Jewish uh, in some ways than uh, uh, the secular cosmopolitan 
musician David. This is, by the way, uh, the front cover of Mary Jane Rochelson's edition of The Melting Pot, by far the best edition of The Melting Pot. It uh, has all the qualities of a Norton edition, but much cheaper uh, and really well worthwhile getting. And you can see just the image of America, the future, looking to the horizon, the future, looking forward, not backwards. Okay more debates around the melting pot. And, and here, I think Ralph, the great African-American novelist, uh, Ralph Ellison, I think, uh, is really very interesting on this. So in an essay published in the late 70s, he talks about uh, imposing a loose conceptual order upon the chaos of American society by viewing it as a melting pot. He says, today the me metaphor is noisily rejected vehemently disavowed. It's come under attack, he says, in the name of ethnicity, or what Kalin calls cultural pluralism, uh, uh, what we, we would call multiculturalism, um, American pluralism. And I can talk more about this in relation, say, to David Hollinger's wonderful book, uh, American uh, Post-Ethnicity uh, post in America. So ethnicity, he, he, he believes, is the problem, not the melting pot. He says, today before the glaring inequalities, unfamiliar promises and rich possibilities of democracy. So this is, a, of course, at a time when uh, African-Americans are still uh, very much second class citizens in America. He said, we, uh, instead of dealing with those issues, he said, all we do is hear heady evocations of European, African and Asian background, accompanied by chants, proclaiming the unviability of ancestral blood, descent, or Kalen saying we can't change our grandfathers. So the unviability of ancestral blood. So totally against this form of identity politics, which he feels doesn't engage with uh, the real issues of American society and doesn't uh, uh, bring together people, but separates people. He says, as of now, I see the denial of that goal of cultural integration, cultural integration, that uh, is the cultural there is the key word for which the melting pot was an accented metaphor as the current form of an abiding American self-distrust. So not believing in the melting pot, he says, is a form of self-distrust. And he goes on, melting pot disclaimers notwithstanding, Americans seem to have sensed intuitive, intuitively that the possibility of enriching the individual self by such pragmatic, pragmatic and opportunistic appropriations. So people appropriating different cultures as Kathleen does in the play. Ethnic performance, ethnic appropriation, that's how Ralph Ellison defines and thinks of American culture. And in his wonderful fiction, he shows this, explores this. He says that uh, these, these appropriations uh, constitute one of the most precious of uh, America's freedoms. So this is consent he's on the side of, rather than dissent. Key distinction here has to be made between assimilation or acculturation. We've seen that assimilation is used really as a very crude way of uh, attacking Zangwill and others. But actually, I think the word acculturation is, is more useful and um, a richer way of thinking about the melting pot, of thinking about ish the issues that we're looking at in relation to pluralism, ethnicity, etc. So Kahan gives us an example of this. So this was in his ghetto book, uh, Influenced by Zangwill, and he talks about the east side, he said, one of the most densely populated spots on the face of the earth, a seething human, uh, just wait, a seething human sea, fed by streams, streamlets and rills of immigration. So here, the idea of melting, sea, water, rills of immigration flowing from all the Yiddish speaking centers of Europe, uh, in fine people with all sorts of antecedents. So again, not one sort of antecedents, many 
uh, tastes, habits, inclinations, speaking all sorts of sub dialects the same, of the same jargon, thrown pell-mell into one social cauldron. So again, the image of the melting pot, a human hodgepodge with its component parts changed, but not yet fused into a homogenous whole. So here we're back to the, uh, uh, an early view of the melting pot as a process uh, where change happens on all sides, not just in, uh, the immigrant changing, but the culture as a whole changing, uh, a culture of appropriation in Ralph Ellison's terms. Mary Antin here complicates things even further. She says, and in this wonderful opening to The Promised Land, her memoir, she says, I was born, I have lived, and I've been made over. Is it not time to write my life story? I am just as much out of the way as if I were dead, for I am other than the person whose story I have to tell. I could speak in the third person and not feel that I was masquerading. I can analyze my subjects. I can reveal everything. For she, and not I, is my real heroine. My life I have still to live. Her life ended when mine began. Now there's not a better example here uh, away from Du Bois of what's called double consciousness. So seeing oneself as a split individual. So she, she has the two sides. One side is an immigrant, if you like, in the melting pot, and the other side who's come through. But it's not as if these two sides aren't connected and that you don't view each side. Uh, you view yourself as an outsider. Um, you view yourself as split with a double consciousness in this way. So that's why unitary versions of the melting pot really are very reductive and very crude. And Mary Antin complicates things even further because she does something which Horace Kalin said is anathema, uh, which one shouldn't do. She said, I'm, most, I'm glad most of all that the Americans began by being Englishmen, for thus did I come to inherit this beautiful language in which I think. So for Antin, it was English that brought together her with the country as a whole. And I think that's Ralph Ellison's view as well. Um, so one can have the English language, but that doesn't mean in Horace Kalin's terms that one is simply reduced. Uh, one can have that and still think of one's identity in plural and partial ways. And I think Zhang Will really touched on this as well. And most uh, interestingly, in relation to African-Americans in the afterword, he talks about the American comic spirit, not dissimilar to Ralph Ellison. Uh, this spirit of appropriation for Ellison is very much a comic spirit, which cannot fail to note the sp uh, spiritual misogynation. So spiritual, again, is the key word, which while clothing, commercializing and Christianizing the ex-African has given ragtime and the dance halls that go with it, first to white America and then to the whole white world. The action of the crucible is, that, is thus not exclusively physical. So in other words, he's not simply talking about physical assimilation, and that was what he was criticized about, but we've seen different kinds of assimilation and acculturation in Kathleen, uh, ethnic performance. Um, it's not simply about integration. It's not simply about marrying uh, different uh, people from different ethnicities, but it's, but it's certainly about seeing oneself and being outside of a singular identity and a singular heritage. Okay, I'm not sure about time, but I'm just about there. So a quick conclusion and, and a short critical biography of books unmentioned so far. Okay, so Zhang Will took, I think, received ways of thinking and made them his own. So from the rural ghetto uh, to the urban translet transatlantic ghetto from Herzli and political Zionism to Jewish territorialism from, and this is an example that we haven't looked at, but Zhang will believe me, many, many more examples. I could give a whole other lecture on different aspects of Zhang will, 
Uh, here it's Edgar Allan Poe's Lock Crime Mysteries. So Edgar Allan Poe was the first to write about these, but the Big Bow Mystery popularised them uh, and took them and popularised. And it's considered uh, the first popular locked room mystery. So these crime mysteries where someone's dead in the locked room, how did they die? Um, so the Big Bow Mystery is uh, a very popular example of that. It's been turned into a film. Um, but that's kind of how Zhang Wil work, worked. He took ideas and concepts, made them his own and popularized them. In the same way, I think Zhang Wil took uh, President Roosevelt's exclusive notion of the melting pot, non-hyphenated Anglo-Saxon unitary, made it a much more open and inclusive concept, uh, not least by ethnicizing rather than Americanizing the melting pot. So rather than reinforcing polarities between Kalin and Zangwill, for instance, it's this broader concept of the melting pot as articulated by Ralph Ellison, Tamar Jacobi, Werner Sollers, that is the most productive in understanding issues, I think, concerning cultural pluralism, assimilation, acculturation, multiculturalism. After all, as I've argued, the melting pot is a process and not a single fixed belief. Okay, and these are a few of the books that uh, I haven't mentioned that have helped me with this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shiat. This has been really wonderful. Um, and I know we've got a couple of questions. Um, wanted to welcome our audience to put their questions or comments in the Q&A section. We've got one here from David Weinfeld who writes, I agree with your reading of Zangwill, but is it possible that he and Callan were actually much closer in their ideas? Callan and Zangwill knew each other and were friendly. My theory is that Zangwill, Callan, Randolph Bourne, W.E.B. Du Bois, Jane Addams, and other liberals and progressives of the time were in favor of a similarly pluralistic ideas for navigating American diversity and that contemporary scholars are too hung up on their differences rather than their similarities. What do you think of this? I think that's really interesting. Um, and certainly uh, there's, there are all kinds of crossovers. I mentioned the use of the orchestra, the harmonizing orchestra. Um, and uh, that's an image that last, has lasted so well. I don't know if you've seen a play by an American playwright, which came to London, but all, was also all over the United States called Bad Jews. Bad Jews, uh, Joshua Harmon wrote it. And he just played and had enormous fun with the idea of a, a harmonious orchestra in present day America and uh, his was the least harmonious orchestra that you can imagine. So certainly Kalin and Zhang will have all kinds of things in common. Um, I think uh, Kalin's fixed view of ethnicity going, uh, based on ancestral ethnicity is something in the end that Zhang will couldn't agree with and doesn't agree with that in the melting pot. Um, um, but I think you're right to say they have, um, if, there were, if it was a Venn diagram, it would cover uh, a good half of the Venn diagram they would have in common. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, Jacob Geiner writes, what did Zangwill make of the Bund and theorists like Simon Dubnov and Vladimir Medem? How did he respond to or critique the idea of na national cultural autonomy for Jews, if at all? Can you, can you repeat that? that? That was quite a complicated question. Right. Uh, Jacob writes, what did Zang will make of the Bund and theorists like Simon Dubnov and Vladimir, Vladimir Medem? How did he respond to or critique the idea of national cultural autonomy for Jews, if at all? Um, now that, that, that's interesting. Um, and I'd bring in Ahad Aham there as well. Um, I think what uh, historians of Zionism have shown most recently is that uh, no Zionists actually thought of um, 
a, a, a Jewish nation state in the way that it turned out. Uh, there were all kinds of versions of cultural autonomy, uh, of nation building, of uh, having all kinds of uh, enclaves in and around Palestine, especially, um, that uh, virtually all uh, nationalists, Jewish nationalists, agreed with. It's only, it's reading history backward to assume that they all started with a conventional Western view of the nation state, which obviously Israel in the end became that, but um, certainly no Zionist uh, thought that at the time. Um, and so that I would, what the, the problem I have with looking at this only from a, a kind of Zionist point of view is that Jewish territorialism fits very well into that argument and should also feed into that argument. And territorialists did look uh, at, or, at, at uh, Jewish historians, Zionists such as Pinsker, especially in Herzl, uh, as reinforcing their view of the world. Uh, so they didn't see any real uh, contradiction between being a territorialist and being a Zionist. And in fact, um, Max Norder wrote to Zangwill and said, a, a territorialist is a Zionist, and he always carried that note with him. So I think uh, mm -hmm. Jewish historians that had all kinds of versions of cultural autonomy is something that, that Zangwill would have interested Zangwill for sure. Uh, you know, you've corrected, I think, one of the misconceptions about Zangwill. I think certainly that I had that, as you've told us, there was more give and take in this process idea of the melting pot. And so it does make me wonder why that, why that dropped out of so many of our perceptions. Um, and even, I mean, I think you read us some quotation about the potential for loss, that this might not be a totally positive mm. thing, which which sounds almost modern in my ears, that mm. um, analysis of what mm. a consideration might mean. Uh, you think that at the t early 20th century, uh, thinkers and Americans just weren't willing or, or ready to hear that possibility for loss or give and take? That the I, that's interesting. Um, Certain thinkers were, mm. it, it, such a, and we've seen Ralph Ellison and, and others uh, were for sure. Mm. Um, at the time, I think Samuel was misread. The, uh, the uh, mainstream Jewish communities very much uh, were concerned about Samuel being on the side of intermarriage. He himself was intermarried, uh, as was Max Nordau, as was Herzl. Uh, um, uh, this wasn't a primary concern if you were a Jewish nationalist, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe the problem with Zangwill is that, again, he's on the wrong side of history, as he was with territorialism. Um, what has prevailed in, in America is um, cultural pluralism is a form of pluralism based around communities. This is what David Hollinger argues, which actually just takes uh, racial categories and turns them into multicultural categories. So if you look at the five multicultural categories of, I'll try and remember them, African-American, Caucasian, Asian-American, um, Native American, and... I've missed one out, but essentially they correspond to red, black, yellow, uh, brown, Hispanic American, um, and white. So what David Hollinger argues is that you the he calls it an ethno-racial pentagon. So this so race has not gone away in America. Um, I mean, to that extent, Nathan Glaze is right. The melting pot. <laughs> has not happened. Uh, it has not transcended race and racial difference. Um, and I think the reason Zangwill is relevant is because he's on the side of uh, uh, consent, of crossing communal boundaries, 
So American pluralism is very conservative with a small c. It's based around fixed communities, which look at themselves in relation to dissent and antecedents and fixed identities. Now, there's nothing wrong in, in, in that, but um, uh, there's more to life, there's more, than a, more to identity than simply that communal way of, of looking at oneself. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Zangwill, I think, uh, still perhaps might have a second life in America. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can get in another question, I, I guess I always wondered if Zangwill were, were writing about um, British Jews of his time, uh, what would he have been writing about in the early 20th century? Uh, what was well, his view of what was going on? Well, yeah. he could be quite scathing about British Jews. Mm -hmm. He was scathing about um, assimilation, actually. Scathing about um, middle class Jews who who disregarded uh, um, poorer immigrants. Um, he also wrote against a kind of uh, narrow-minded orthodoxy. So in Children of the Ghetto, uh, for purely legalistic reasons, um, a man and a woman ends up married, even though they didn't want to be. Um, uh, so he he was could be um, when it came to middle class Jews, I think was quite uh, scathing. When it came to poorer Jews, immigrant Jews, he rather like the melting pot, he wanted to humanize them and he wanted to show uh, their value their, uh, the, their value to the nation and their own values and look at them in this kind of spiritual way as a way of fitting into the nation. Um, and, he, and it is said that his novel, Children of the Ghetto, uh, prevented anti-immigration legislation for about a decade. So there was talk of anti-immigration legislation uh, as early as 1895, and he uh, and uh, his supporters fought it tooth and nail. Um, so I think uh, when it came to poorer immigrant Jews, that's when Zangwill was at his best. Hmm. Well, I know we've kept you late and it's much later where you are, um, but I wanna thank you for this really wonderful talk. It was such a, a treat for us. Um, so uh, we're so glad to have you with us today. And, and thank you, everyone in our audience. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. I hope, uh, I hope my son wasn't right that there were too many words on the, on the slides and too many slides. Not at all. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks so much.